Well, for more on today's events from Jackson Hole, I'm joined by John Tamney, editor of Real Clear Markets and Forbes magazine. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So let's start with Fe uh, Fed Chair Powell's speech. What were the biggest takeaways for you? Well, there was really nothing to take away in that he basically spouted the age-old Fed view that economic growth causes inflation. Now, to be clear about that, that is an entirely backwards point of view. What drives economic growth? Investment. Investment is all about creating more and more goods and services at lower and lower prices. So if you look at periods of big economic growth, prices are, in fact, falling. We've seen this over the past several years with, with the cost of Wi-Fi access, with the cost of, of cell phones, with the cost of computers. They're plummeting. Economic growth is about productivity enhancements. And so it's odd to me, but not surprising. The Fed thinks it needs to restrain economic growth when, in fact, economic growth is the biggest enemy rising prices have ever known. So why do you think Powell is drawing this correlation then? Um, it's historically been the view held inside the Fed. The Fed believes in a discredited phenomenon called, called the Phillips curve that basically says as the economy grows, demand for, for goods outstrips supply alongside the fact that we run out of, uh, of labor because demand for labor outstrips supply. It fails in two obvious ways. For one, production if we're demanding things, it means we're producing things first. Production and, and demand basically mirror one another. Uh, secondly, when you talk about, un, about labor force participation, the U.S. and its, its companies access the world's labor force. Boeing, for instance, manufactures the 787 in seven different countries around the world. Harley-Davidson, the most American of companies, manufactures its motorcycles in, in, in Austria, in China, Japan. That's where it gets goods and parts for. Apple produces nothing in the United States. All of its production takes place in China. Nike has never manufactured really anything in the United States. Most of its production takes place in China. So the Fed's models are based on this assumption that the U.S. is an economic island solely reliant on, on factory capacity and also labor capacity in the United States. That's just not true. And you bring up an interesting point about global supply chains. Then, given that we have this trade war going on between the U.S. and China, are you surprised then that it didn't feature more prominently in what the Fed had to say? I am surprised, and all I can think is that, for one, J Jerome Powell is somewhat of a new person. He's never really been involved in the trade discussion and probably doesn't know how to make that argument. For two, I think people like being in these highfalutin jobs like Fed chairman, even though market signals are basically saying that the Fed is rushing toward irrelevance as a player economically. So I don't think that Powell wants to get on the wrong side of Donald Trump. But if you are going to make an argument or a discussion about economic growth, how can you not talk about tariffs and barriers to trade that, by definition, would have a very negative impact on the U.S. economy? Let's be clear. The U.S. has the most valuable companies in the world. Apple's number one. Where does it get a quarter of its revenues? From sales in China. Nike's second largest market is China. Boeing sells one quarter of its planes in China. Uh, GM sold more cars in China in the first quarter than it did in North America. So to talk about the economy and not make a big stress on the importance of not going in the directions of ta direction of tariffs was, was very odd, but it speaks to how politicized the Fed has always been. It's never so, been independent. So, John, let's, let's talk about the role of the Fed then. We're 10 years out from the global financial crisis. What should the role of global central banks be at this point? Why would we have a central bank in this instance? Let's be clear. What, did, what, is, what does the Fed do? It is the lender of last resort to solvent banks. A solvent bank would never go to the Fed for a loan. It's an admission of bankruptcy. So the Fed exists to prop up the weakest banks, which weakens the system overall. The Fed is also a bank regulator. Well, how did 2008 work out for you? It's one of the more inept regulators in existence. And then the third thing, the Fed aims to set a rate, a short rate at which banks lend to one another overnight. Well, an interest rate is a price like any other. You wouldn't need a central bank for it. Now, let me be clear. I'm not one of these people saying the Fed is the source of all of our um, economic ills. My argument is that the Fed is rushing toward irrelevance. It is projecting its influence through banks that represent 15 percent of all credit in the U.S. economy. The, so, then, so then is it a case that we should be instead looking at the market indicators versus what the direction that the Fed is trying to take 
Oh, absolutely. And, and look at what just happened today. The Fed, the theory is that when the Fed talks about raising rates, is that the markets sell off in a major way because they're fearful that the, Reds, the Fed's raising the cost of credit. Well, look at what happened today. And, that's, and, and it happened with good reason. Implicit in the notion that the Fed can control the cost of credit is that seven to nine guys in Washington, D.C. are controlling what is a global price. If you believe the Fed controls the cost of credit, you also believe that rent control works. But in reality, credit is a, is a global phenomenon. Lending is a function of how much production there is. When you borrow money, you're borrowing what money can be exchanged for, trucks, tractors, computers, that's just, right. the Fed can't set the price for that, and that's the market's reaction. What can the Fed really do one way or the other? That's the question. Thank you so much. Great having you on. John Tamney, their editor for Real Clear Markets and Forbes magazine.